A few weeks ago, I made a video where I talked about 13 frustrations related to the iPhone and how to fix them, and a lot of you watched it. Clearly, there are a lot of things about the iPhone that really annoy you. So in this video, I'm going to share 13 more frustrating things about the iPhone and some really easy fixes for them. Some of them are new, some of them have been around for a while, but all of them are going to help you have a much better iPhone experience. Okay, let's get into it. If you ever find the volume on your iPhone fluctuating or being especially loud in certain situations and you find that irritating, there are a couple of settings that you probably don't know about that can make this a lot better. If you go into settings, then scroll down to sounds and haptics and then scroll to the very bottom of the page, you'll see a section called built-in speaker and there are a couple of options in here. If you tap volume limit, you can turn on limit maximum volume. When you do that, you'll see a slider that lets you set the maximum volume that your iPhone is allowed to reach, anywhere from 20% up to 90%. So for example, if you set this to 90%, the loudest your iPhone can go is 90% of its normal maximum. In other words, slightly quieter. As you move the slider lower, the maximum volume reduces accordingly. So if you're someone who often finds your iPhone too loud, you might wanna set this to 50 or 60%, and no matter what, your iPhone won't go beyond that level. The only exceptions to this are the categories that Apple lists here. Calls, FaceTime calls, emergency calls and alerts, ringtones, alarms, system sounds, and find my sounds. Those won't be limited. If you tap the back button, you'll see another option underneath called reduce loud sounds. If you turn this on, your iPhone essentially applies a compressor to the audio coming from your device. If you're not familiar with what that means, it basically reduces the range between the quietest and loudest sounds. Quiet sounds become a little louder, making them easier to hear, and loud sounds become quieter, which means you're less likely to get startled by a sudden explosion in a TV show or a loud audio spike when you're scrolling through reels on Instagram. Play around with both of these settings and see what works best for you and your setup. By the way, if you watch videos like this and think, well, that's great, but I'll definitely forget it later, I've made something to fix that. I send one short free iPhone tip every day direct to your inbox. It's called the Daily Swipe. It takes 30 seconds to read and it genuinely helps you remember and actually use these tips like the ones in this video. Just scan the QR code on screen or tap the link in the description to join for free. When you're composing an email and you paste a link into the email, you might have noticed that in recent years, the link appears as a preview of the website that you're linking to. This can be useful, but I think in most cases, it just looks a bit messy and it can make it harder to compose the rest of your email clearly. There are a couple of ways around this. The first is to tap on the preview of the link until you see a little downward pointing arrow to the right of the preview. Tap that and choose convert to plain link. The preview will disappear and you'll have a regular clickable link instead, much more like the links that we're used to. If you know that you always prefer plain links and you never want previews at all, there is a setting that you can change. Go into settings, scroll all the way down and tap apps, then scroll down and choose mail. Scroll to the bottom of this screen to the composing section and you'll see an option called add link previews. If this is enabled, that's why the previews are showing up. If you disable it, they won't appear moving forward. Let's say that you've been sent a message by someone and you want to copy part of that message and forward it on to somebody else. Historically, the way that you would have done this is by long pressing on the message choosing copy, and it would copy the entire message. You'd then have to paste it into something like notes, cut out the bit that you actually want, and then copy and paste it back into messages. Thankfully, Apple have resolved this in iOS 26. As long as you're on the latest version of iOS, you can now do this directly inside the messages app. Just long press on the message in question and choose select. You'll get the familiar text selection box. Move the beginning and end markers to highlight the exact part of the message that you want. Then tap copy and you can do whatever you like with that selected portion. Another frustration I have with Apple is the price of their accessories, especially when there are better options from other brands that cost far less. Take this iPhone Air MagSafe battery. Sure, it's sleek, very Apple in its design, but it only works with the iPhone Air, even though it's a MagSafe product. So if your friend has an iPhone 17 and you wanna share it, you can't. It also charges slowly at 12 watts, has a pretty measly 3000 milliamp hour capacity and costs around $100 or pounds here in the UK. 
Compare that with the Nano Power Bank from Anker, who are kindly sponsoring today's video. It's the thinnest 5,000 milliamp power power bank in the world, basically as slim as Apple's version, but it charges faster, up to 15 watts, and works with any MagSafe iPhone, not just the Air. It also costs less than half the price and comes in a range of colors. And if you're in the US, check out Anker's 45 watt nano charger. The iPhone 17 now supports fast charging when paired with a 40 watt or higher adapter, and this tiny GAN powered charger handles it easily. It's more affordable and noticeably lighter than Apple's 40 watt dynamic power adapter, runs cooler thanks to GAN technology, and even includes a six foot USB C cable in the box. Both can charge an iPhone 17 to 50% in around 20 minutes, but the Anker Nano is smaller, lighter, and more affordable. So for me, it's the obvious pick. Check out the link in the description to get your Anker products today. In the Music app, you get the volume slider down at the bottom of the screen, which gives you quick access to make any volume changes that you want while you're listening to your music. But if you've ever noticed, when you lock your phone and the music player shows up as a sort of widget on your lock screen, the volume slider disappears. At that point, you're dependent on the physical volume buttons on the side of your phone. You might be perfectly fine with that, but personally, I would much rather still have access to the volume slider, and there is a way to bring it back. Open settings, then choose accessibility. Scroll down to the hearing section and tap audio and visual. In here, turn on always show volume control. Now the next time the music player appears on your lock screen, the volume slider will be visible again. You just need to tap the music player widget and you can control the volume exactly as you normally would. The calculator app on the iPhone is where I see two of the most common complaints related to the iPhone. The first is when you're inputting a calculation and you make a mistake. Maybe you tap one or two digits incorrectly. A lot of people still seem to think that the only way to fix this is to press the cancel button and start the whole thing again. But you don't need to do that. There is a backspace button in the top left of the calculator and it behaves just like the backspace key in a text editor. It lets you delete one digit at a time, so you can fix your mistake quickly. The other thing that I hear people complain about is that after they've done a calculation, they leave the app to go and do something else, and when they come back, the calculation has disappeared, and they think that they have to start all over again. But there's a history button in the top left of the calculator as well. It's the little clock icon. If you tap that, you can see your recent calculation history. You can tap any calculation in your history to bring it straight back into the calculator, or you can long press on a calculation in your history to either copy just the result or copy the entire expression. And from there, you can do whatever you like with that data. I'm sure you already know about the back tap feature on your iPhone by now. It's the feature where you literally double tap the back of your iPhone and the phone will run a process that you've assigned. Because you can link things like shortcuts or items from control center to back tap, can actually do some really cool things. For example, I've got mine set so that Backtap brings up the new reminder window at the top of the screen, which makes it really easy for me to add reminders without opening the app. But a common complaint is that Backtap can be a bit too sensitive. What most people don't realize is that the fix for this is really simple. Go into settings, then accessibility, then scroll down to the physical and motor section and tap touch. Scroll all the way to the bottom and tap back tap. This is where you assign the back tap feature and most people choose double tap simply because it's the first option. But instead of using double tap, assign your shortcut to triple tap instead. That way it takes three taps rather than two, which makes it far less likely that you'll trigger it by mistake. Moving apps around the home screen of your iPhone, whether it's between pages or into folders, has long been a real frustration for a lot of iPhone owners. The whole process is fiddly and messy. You either find yourself chasing a folder around the screen or hovering your finger at the edge while you wait for the iPhone to finally move you to the next page. But there is a much better way of doing this and most people I speak to don't know about it. So let me show you a couple of tips. First of all, when you want to move more than one item, long press on the first app like you normally would and start dragging it. But instead of dropping it and coming back for the others, just tap any additional apps that you want to include. That creates a stack. You're now moving all of those items at once, which is obviously much quicker. Now let's say that you wanna drop that stack into a folder. Instead of hovering over the folder, which is where most of the problems happen because you end up chasing the folder all over the screen, use another finger to tap the folder 
to open it and then simply drop the stack straight into it. This also works when you're moving apps between pages. Instead of hovering at the left or right edge of the screen and waiting for your iPhone to move you across, use your other finger to swipe to the next page yourself. You can then let go, just like normal, and the apps will drop exactly where you want them. Force closing apps, which is where you swipe up and hold for a second at the bottom of your screen to get to the app carousel, then swipe up to close an app, is something that, in general, you shouldn't need to do. Your iPhone is very capable of managing its resources, and the official advice from Apple is that unless an app becomes unresponsive, you should never need to force quit. But some people do still like to force quit all of their apps every now and then, and a frustration I hear a lot is that there's no way to close all apps at once. You have to swipe through them one at a time. Well, here's an old but really useful tip. You can close up to three apps at the same time by using three fingers in the app carousel. Just swipe up with three fingers and the three apps currently in view will be closed instantly. This whole process is obviously three times quicker than doing it one at a time. A frustration that I hear from friends and family quite a lot is in relation to Control Center. Control Center is a really useful part of your iPhone, but the thing people struggle with the most, and I completely relate to this, is that the little icons can be really confusing. Some of the icons look a lot like others, or they're just so abstract that you'd never guess what they're meant to represent. The vehicle motion cues icon, for example, unless you happen to remember what it is, there is no way you're going to look at that and magically know that it's vehicle motion cues. There is a really easy fix for this that most people don't know about, and that's to take the single control center tiles and turn them into double width tiles. Here's how you do it. In control center, long press to enter edit mode. Instead of tapping add a control, go to one of the small single tiles and drag down on the little drag bar next to it, just slightly, and then drag to the right. This changes that tile from a single tile into a one by two tile. And once it becomes a one by two tile, you also see the name of the control center function underneath it. No more guessing what anything means, you can see exactly what each one is. It does mean that you can't fit as many tiles on one screen, but Control Center now creates additional pages automatically, so you can expand things across multiple pages however you like. Here's a frustration that my wife shared the other day about her iPhone, and it's another one of those settings that I assume most people know about, but actually most people don't. She was complaining that she likes to set her screen brightness using the brightness slider in Control Center, but recently her iPhone seemed to be doing whatever it wanted with the brightness, and she didn't know how to switch it off. This is controlled by a setting called Auto Brightness. It's exactly what it sounds like. Your iPhone will automatically adjust the brightness on your behalf. But the reason that most people don't know about it is because the setting isn't where you'd expect it to be. It's not in Display and Brightness, it's in Accessibility. So go into settings, scroll down and tap accessibility, then tap display and text size. And right at the bottom of the page, you'll see a toggle called auto brightness. If you enable this, your iPhone will decide what the brightness should be based on the lighting conditions around you. If you switch it off, you have full manual control over the brightness at all times. This next one is kind of an old one, but I still hear people mention it all the time. It's the frustration where you disable live photos in your camera only to find that the next time you take a photo, your iPhone has captured a live photo anyway. There are two things you need to do to fix this. First, in the camera app, make sure you're in photo mode, then tap the little menu button in the top right corner of the screen. In here, make sure that live is set to off. That's the live icon with a strike through it. If it has a little A next to it, that means live mode is set to auto, and if it's yellow, that means live is on. Once you've turned it off, you then need to go to settings, scroll down and tap camera, then tap preserve settings. Scroll all the way to the bottom and make sure live photo is enabled. What preserve settings does is exactly what the name suggests. It preserves your settings. It means the change that you've just made to live photo, turning it off, will stay off until you turn it back on again. So as long as you don't manually change it, your camera won't enable live photo the next time that you use it. This tip is probably going to get me some hate from app developers, and I am sorry about that, but ultimately this fixes a frustration that a lot of people have on their iPhones. Those pop-ups that appear when you're in an app asking you to rate the app. In an ideal world, we'd all have the time to go and write detailed reviews of every app that we use, but the reality is we don't. So it is nice to know how to switch this off 
if you want to. To do it, go into settings, scroll all the way to the bottom and tap apps, then choose App Store. Scroll to the bottom of that page and you'll see an option called in-app ratings and reviews. Toggle this off and from now on, apps won't prompt you to rate them. You can still leave reviews and ratings manually in the App Store whenever you like, you just won't get pop-ups asking you to. You know when you go to share something on your iPhone, maybe you tap the share button on a photo and you get that row of apps that you can use to share it. And then above that, there's a row of options that's constantly changing. It's usually a list of contacts or groups on your device, and it can include things like AirDrop, messages, WhatsApp, and so on. It all varies depending on your phone. This is known as Siri suggestions, and while it can be really useful, can also be quite distracting, especially if it isn't showing the people or sharing methods that you actually want. So if you don't tend to use it, there is a way to switch it off. Go into settings, scroll down to Apple Intelligence and Siri, then scroll to the bottom of that page into the suggestions section and disable show when sharing. Now, if you go back and repeat the sharing steps again, you'll notice that the entire Siri suggestion section has been removed from the share sheet. You'll now go through the more manual process of tapping messages, mail, or whatever method you want, and then sharing from there. So there you go, that's 13 frustrations for the iPhone and how to fix them. Combine that with the 13 that we covered in the previous video, and that's 26 frustrations fixed in total. But what do you think? Anything that I should have included in this video? Drop me a comment and let me know. And as ever, if you found this video useful, do please consider leaving me a like and subscribing to my channel for more content like this in the future. See you on the next video.